So, so in this conference with um, with Mike, with Claude and Yasin and Stefan, what we're trying to do this year and also, I mean, the previous conference is to put together um, two distinct community of economists, uh, those working on IO and energy markets. We tend to go to more in IO or energy conferences. And those who are more interested in the design of environmental policies or environmental and resource economics, like someone like me. Uh, so, uh, and, and that's not easy because as you say, that confer I mean, you, you could see it's this divide in, in, on the sessions. And, uh, but the good news is that uh, we have someone who kind of like uh, do the merge between the two communities. This is Juan Pablo. So Juan Pablo has made contribution in IO, energy markets, um, in environmental economy, the choice of environmental policies, um, contract theory. So he's uh, really much uh, a synthesis of the two type of community approaches and tools. He's graduate, he has graduated from MIT and then he has been a professor at uh, the Pontifical University of Chile in Santiago for many years. Um, and what is impressive is uh, when you see his, uh, his main contribution to economics that it's managed to uh, publish in uh, general interest journals and also top feed journal in both in IO, energy economics and environmental economics. And also he's also involved in uh, policy advice. So, so this is a perfect, I mean, the perfect match for uh, this kind of conferences. Uh, so he's going to talk about uh, traffic regulation, uh, which is a new topic, I think, uh, one of the new topic of research. So, so now, Juan Pablo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Um, thank you. Well, this is the uh, this is the title. Uh, first of all, well, thank you for for the invitation and for for the opportunity to give a keynote uh, talk. Uh, it's an honor, really. Uh, I mean, the previous keynote speakers, really. Um, so thank you very much. And also, congratulations for the, uh, for the workshop. I think it's great. I mean, to you, to Claude, to Stefan, and to uh, Missing uh, Anjasin as well. So uh, really, very, very good. So yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, I've been working on this for, <laughs> for 10 years now. Um, and I think the reason I'm working on this is because I, uh, I was born and lived in one of these uh, cities. That, you know, <laughs> probably I wouldn't be doing that if I were born in, I don't know, in Little Rock, Arkansas, perhaps. <laughs> or, I don't know, any other small city. And uh, one of these is my home city, and where you see uh, we suffer problems of air pollution during uh, winter and, 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 and the fall and congestion throughout the entire year, except February, which is the, the time of the, of the year in which people take vacation. Otherwise, you know, uh, our congestion is getting, is getting even worse. And, um, and there are all the cities there, Mexico City is over there, while well, the U.S. Is, uh, also have a picture there too. So it's happening in many, in many cities around the world, not only in, in my own city. And what really worries me is this picture here. I don't know if you can see that very well. Which is the rate of motorization in emerging and developing economies, you know, is growing very fast and they still have a way, you know, large way to go, much higher. In the US it's pretty much stable if you want with, I don't know, 800 uh, cars per 1,000 uh, people. In Europe it's, I think it's uh, 581 per 1,000, the same thing in, in Japan and, and, and South Korea. But in the rest of the world, in the developing and in emerging, you know, like in emerging economies, they're still way below those numbers. And when you look at how much, you know, cars are being sold every single day, it's poof, it's, it's, it's really uh, worrisome. I mean, it's, 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 it's a problem. So, um, so the question is, what do you do about that? I mean, these cars create, you know, a lot of externalities. Uh, of course, pollution is one of the most important ones, but also well, traffic congestion and other ones. And if, 
I think a good way to start is going back to this uh, paper. It's a nice, very nice paper, a survey paper by Ian Parry and, uh, and co-authors that came out in the Journal of Economic Literature uh, more than 10 years ago, talking about these issues. About, you know, what are the policy instruments that, you know, uh, in different parts of the world people are using to correct for these externalities, and the externalities is the one you know. I mean, uh, local air pollution, traffic congestion, and also global air pollution and uh, traffic accidents, uh, oil dependency, particularly for some countries, for some other countries maybe, maybe not that much, and, uh, and other externalities like noise and uh, urban sprawl, which I'm not going to talk much about it. I'm mostly I'm going to focus on the first two, which are local problems. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but indirectly when you correct these two externalities, local air pollution and, uh, and traffic congestion, you know, as a byproduct, you're also reducing CO2 uh, automatically. But I'm not going to, you know, show you numbers on that, but it's, it's, it's something that is, is, is true. So, uh, in the same, in the same uh, paper, you know, Parry and, and, and co-authors, they say, well, these are the policy instruments that people are using. You know, fuel taxes is one, and also for new cars, you have this, this fuel economy. Uh, standard for new vehicles in the, here in, 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 uh, in the, the CAFE standard in the US. And uh, also emission standards for new vehicles, you know, how much they can emit per, per, per mile. And uh, Euro 6, for example, I think right now in Europe we're in Euro 6. And, uh, and then the, that's pretty much it. These are the instruments that was mentioned in that paper in 2007. Plus, you know, they explained, well, also we have this policy that is emerging, congestion tolls. Um, by then, you have, we have only, you know, these stalls in, in, in four places, in some cities in, in, in Norway, Singapore, of course, the first one, and then London in 2003, the, which was like a, a big, big event, you know, first time, you know, a big city implements this. And not much since then. I mean, uh, uh, Stockholm, Milan, Gothenburg, and New York. This is big news. New York it seems to, you know, they already approved to have a congestion toll to enter you know, the lower, here, here is London, and, uh, and, and New York already, you know, agreed to implement a congestion toll. This is how, it's, a, it's like a, a daily pass. If you enter New York, lower Manhattan, you had to pay this daily pass. And that's supposed to be to start in 2020, not before that. But, I mean, the news is that it's going to go through, but it's not 100% sure yet. I mean, there's still maybe some legal issues, uh, or, but apparently it's going to go, it's going to go through. Um, but these are only the instruments, you know, considering this in this paper. There's a lot more going on. Uh, this is what I want to talk to you about. A lot more than this, this instruments. Actually, this, you see a little bit of these instruments being used elsewhere than in these places. I mean, fuel taxes, well, we're in France. We know what happens when you say, look, we want to increase, you know, fuel taxes to, to correct for some of these externalities. So the question is, if these instruments are not available, congestion pricing and all that, what else have you know, uh, policymakers been using in the, in, in, uh, in the world? And uh, we see a lot of things going on. And I want to focus on some of them, the ones that have been used for, in particular, for example, in my, in my home city and in, in, other, in other places. For example, we have this high occupancy uh, vehicle lanes. Uh, that in which you, uh, you allow some people to go in one lane if they are two or more people, you know, in the car. And if you are only one passenger, then you need to use the other, the other lanes. There's a lot of discussion whether this is efficient or not because you are moving traffic to the other lanes and, the end, and you may end up with more congestion or even more pollution. There's some, you know, paper showing, showing that. Uh, in Jakarta, there was a program and you, need to, you needed to have three people in the car and they decided you know, last year to remove that, or two years ago to remove that, that, that program, for example. So there's a lot of you know, uh, controversy about you know, you know, the efficiency of this, of this instrument. Then we have, and I think in this, uh, in this conference we've seen some people presenting this, uh, work on taxes or subsidies for new cars, just for new cars, carbon taxes. Uh, for example, in, in France, this is a famous you know, uh, program uh, malus and bonus, uh, in which you have a, a subsidy or tax depending on the type of the car. If the car, you know, has a very low fuel efficiency, then you have to pay a tax. If it's a, you know, a high fuel efficiency, then you get a you get a subsidy. And uh, there's some some papers uh, uh, looking at, at at that. The problem with that is that it only affects the new cars. So I mean the you know the new cars. 
And so it's only indirectly can affect the existing fleet. And it may take time for this to happen, to really have an effect on the, on the existing fleet. And in some cases, uh, these uh, subsidies, they suffer from, you know, uh, from severe adverse selection problems. You're giving subsidies to people that would have bought these cars you know, otherwise. For example, this is a nice NBR working paper showing exactly that in the US, that you are paying a lot of these subsidies for people that uh, would have bought these cars any, any, anyway. And uh, we also see these are in some, some way better because they are aiming at the very old cars, these scrappage subsidies or these uh, cash for clunker programs. And uh, we see them in the US, also in Europe, in Spain, in France. But the, the problem with them is that typically they are not you know, designed as an environmental policy instrument. They are mostly designed to somehow to help the local industry during a recession, for example. So they last only for a short period of time, only a few months, three, four months. I think this is a, how much they last. So, uh, but the good thing is that you're really aiming at the very old cars, polluting ones, so that's, that's a good part. The bad part, as I said, is just they, they don't last too long. So you cannot rely on this uh, as an environmental policy, in part because they're very expensive. I mean, these are you know, subsidies that are very, very expensive. And you don't see this policy anywhere else than in these few you know, industrialized countries. I mean, I, I don't know any, anybody in the developing world using this kind of uh, um, cash for clunker programs. How about pollution, pollution charges? And uh, there are some, there are only two experiences with this. Which is, this is a very good instrument. Actually, this is the best instrument that you can think of to attack both congestion and local pollution, which is what is being done in London and also in Milan, which is basically you had to pay you know, a congestion toll to enter you know, some area, downtown, say, or, or even a, you know, a, a larger area. And on top of that, depending on the kind of vehicle that you're driving, whether it's an old or a new, you need to pay like a pollution charge. So this is a very good policy because it's attacking both problems. Uh, the problem is that those are the only two places that, that I know, as far as I know, in which you use this. So it's, uh, again, because these are taxes and uh, it's very hard to, you know, to implement. I think the political economy of the kind of instrument that we see around, I think is, is, is very important to, to understand. And, um, uh, how about smog tax? Basically, you need to you know, bring your car to an inspection station every year, in some places maybe twice a year, uh, to check whether the car, the emissions rate of the car is according to some norm, uh, depending on the, the age of the car, of course. You know, as the car ages, you know, the norm becomes more relaxed. But you want to make sure that you don't have this, you know, cars emitting uh, above that, above the norm uh, on, on, on the street. And what, what happens is that there's some problem. For example, there's a uh, they suffer from some corruption problem, some uh, corruption problems in which you just pay and you some bribe and then you get your car exempted or you get a certificate. So uh, is this a good instrument to avoid, for example, those old, old polluting cars to, you know, to, to go around? And there is some evidence showing that uh, that's not clear, they're doing that, that, that job. And, and finally, and this is going to be most on the rest, I mean, a large part of the rest of my talk, are these rationing schemes that we see more and more often everywhere in the world. Not only in the developing world, they started in the developing world. In Athens, I understand, was the first, I mean, long time ago in 82, was the first place using this for, for only for a short period of time. Then in my home city in Santiago, then Mexico City, and now we see them in many, many places. These are rationing schemes uh, of uh, different types. I think uh, sometimes people call them license plate bans, in which, you know, depending on the last digit of your license plate, you may not be allowed to use your car, for example, on Monday or maybe two, twice a week, depending on the programs. Sometimes depending on whether it's only during peak hours uh, or during the entire day. So there's different, different, different variations of that, uh, that form. And one extreme form of these rationing schemes is these low emission zones, which are very common in some, now in some, in some cities here in Europe, in Germany, for example, in, in particular, in which, you know, some old cars just cannot go into the, uh, into the, uh, into the city center, for example. And uh, typically, these rational schemes, the reason why we have them in the first place, if you, if you read, for example, why, what was the motivation for introducing them, was air pollution. That was the reason. In Mexico City, it was air pollution. They were introduced in 89, where congestion wasn't a big bird problem yet. In my home city was in 86, congestion wasn't an issue there. I mean, the motorization rate was very low, it was pollution. 
That was the, 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 the rationale. And I think in Europe, the, the low emission zones, for example, in Germany, it's, a, it's again, it's pollution. It's not, it's not congested. Uh, but in some other places, for example, in Bogota and other places, now they're thinking about this rationing scheme for also dealing with congestion. It's, at, at the end, the two problems are, 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 are together. Uh, but I think it's important to, to understand the difference between the two because the kind of, the way you design the rationing scheme, it may change. So it's important to, what are you using these schemes for? I think it's, it's, it's important to keep, to keep that, that in mind. How popular are these restrictions? Increasingly popular. Increasingly popular. Here you have some uh, license plates where we see them in, uh, in many different places. I just put a few of them uh, in Quito, in Ecuador, there in Sao Paulo, in the, in the Philippines, uh, in Manila, actually. Uh, also in La Paz, in Bolivia. So you see them in many, many different, different places. And uh, so here you have a list. And uh, when you see the star, it means that they were introduced primarily for air pollution reasons. And, um, and I also here include the low emission zones, because for me these are rational schemes that take a very particular form. And also include here Paris, for example, that introduced a very particular restriction, which was I think two years ago, that they restricted all cars, 97 and older, from entering, you know, the, uh, the city of Paris. Except during the weekends. But during the weekdays, they cannot, they cannot enter. Uh, so that is also a rationing scheme. It's a rationing scheme. There are no prices involved, and it's just... Uh, so I, for, to me, these are all I, all... I call them all driving, driving restrictions of different formats, but these are driving, driving restrictions. Uh, here you have, for example, in Madrid, this Madrid Central, again, another form of uh, driving restrictions in which you're not allowed to enter the, uh, the, the downtown uh, Madrid. And also it depends on the type of car that, that you're driving. Some cars are exempted, for example, electric vehicles, other cars, you know, face larger restrictions. Unfortunately, unfortunately, as we learned, you know, two weeks a day, I mean, two days ago, I think the new local government had decided to remove this policy, which showed some important reductions of uh, local pollutants, carbon monoxide and, and NOx and all that. So um, I think this is one of the few cases in which a policy of uh, driving restrictions have been removed. Typically, these policies, unlike, for example, scrap, scrappage subsidies that remain only for a few months, in most of those places that I show you, these are policies that remain you know, for a long, long time. And, um, here, for example, you have another restrictions uh, uh, rationing scheme in Germany, in which you cannot use this, uh, diesel cars uh, in uh, Hamburg. And also in other cities in Europe are also implementing the same, the same policy. These are restrictions. Again, you're not... But what is interesting is these restrictions have uh, an important distinction from, for example, the, one, the, the first restrictions that we would saw implemented. And when you talk to anybody about driving restrictions, immediately they, they, they come, to their, come to their mind, okay, the policy in Mexico City in 89, in which you basically, you impose a restrictions uniform across all cars, regardless of emissions rates, regardless of age. So it was a uniform restrictions uh, in, uh, in uh, basically that once, uh, once a week you could not use your car. So that's, you, if you want driving restrictions 1.0. But now we see a very different restrictions, which I call vintage-specific restrictions, like the one in Madrid, in, in, in Germany, in other places, uh, which depends on the type of car. If you have a very clean car, you're exempt completely from these restrictions. If your car is old, then you had to uh, be restricted. And I think it's very important to make you know, the distinction between these two, these two types, and I'm going to try to explain why, why is the case. And, um, so, um, so the question, I mean, to understand why or when this, uh, this Russian schemes work, uh, let me, it's important to differentiate between these two types. Uniform restrictions, you know, apply to all cars, regardless of age. And these are the ones like uh, in Mexico in 89 and also in Santiago in 86. And, and the answer to the, to the question, do they work? The answer is no, they don't work. They work really bad. It's a really, uh, it's a really bad policy. That's why people tend to think about rational schemes as really bad policies. When I present this work before, people say, ah, this is, doesn't work. This is, this is, people are going to buy a second car to buy part of the restriction and all that. That's true. I mean, you may get some reduction in the short run. I'm going to show you some work on that that I did with some co-authors for Mexico City. You may get some reduction in the, but only the first month you get some reduction from these uh, programs. But, you know, soon people start buying a second car, typically a very old car, and, uh, and highly pollutant to bypass the restriction. So now you have two cars in your house. The one you had before and a new car. 
and then you end up with more pollution and more congestion. After how, how fast? Very fast. After, you know, one year, even before one year, you get, you know, you go back to the previous, even above the previous level. So it's a, it's a really bad, bad policy. But this is, a, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is the news that I've been, uh, uh, um, the reason why they're so bad, I mean, they're already so bad for those two reasons, I mean, or for this one in particular. But there's another reason. Typical people don't think about it is that you have an effect also in how the fleet is going to evolve over time. The, the new steady state, if you want. And by, by taxing all cars uniformly, basically what you're doing, you are delaying the entry of new cars with a much cleaner. And you end up with an older fleet, and you extend the life of the older cars, and you end up much worse off. That's a problem. I mean, this is a problem. It is. But it's not the main problem. The main problem is when you look at the long, very long run, is that the fleet that you end up with is really bad. It's a bad composition with too many old cars and with a, you know, a very uh, delayed entry of new cars. That's the main, the main you know, channel in which this is operating. All the papers before are just looking at this you know, one month effect or maybe you know, one year effect. And the one year effect already shows you that this is bad, but this is even uh, much worse. So, Bad idea to have these rational schemes in which are they uniform across all, all cars. Now, this is uh, a work we did in Mexico City uh, with some, uh, some co-authors showing why they are so bad. And what we use for this is carbon monoxide emissions from all these uh, monitoring stations that are installed in the city. Why carbon monoxide is a very good proxy for car use, especially during peak hours. Here you have, for example, concentrations from these monitoring stations, these dots, and here you have the actual emissions. During peak hours here, 7 o'clock in the morning, 8 o'clock in the morning, you know, they're perfectly correlated. During the rest of the day, you don't know. Why? Because there's wind and all that, but for example, carbon monoxide during peak hours is a perfect proxy, and that's what we use to test, for example, for this Mexican, for this Mexican policy using these uh, changes in concentration before and after the policy. Uh, and what we found, this is what we found. In the short run, as I said before, 11% uh, decrease. This was a one day a week restriction. So you don't get a 20% reduction because there's some substitution, but you get 11% reduction. But what happened in the long run? By long run here, I mean, you know, during the first year. Well, you have more pollution, 13% more. Why? Because in part, the second car effect uh, was, was kicking here. And I, I cannot show you anything else because I can't go beyond, you know, one with this data, I, can, I cannot go beyond one, 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 one year to tell you these very long run effects on the fleet composition that I mentioned before. Uh, so the policy was already, already bad. Uh, this is a good, you know, uh, exercise because on Sunday there was no restriction. So you can, you can look at what happened during Sundays and there was very little change, you know, in the short run. But in the long run, because you bought another car, you're also using that on Sunday. And then you end up with more pollution, not only during the weekdays, in which you have restrictions, but also other days of the week. Uh, there's also some distributional impacts here. For example, who are the people that bought the second car in Mexico, you know, as many other cities in the, well, around the world, you know, income is very segregated around the city. So you have, for example, here, uh, low income areas, medium income areas, and here you have high income areas where you have the monitoring stations. So you can look by looking at each particular monitoring station, the impact of this policy. And who were the ones that bought the second car? This is the famous hypothesis. And we found that were people in the middle income area. Why? Because people with uh, high income already had two cars to handle the restrictions quite well. And people, you know, in the low income areas, they didn't have the money to afford a second car. So all the actions was here. This was the guy that were, and here you have, for example, summary with this, this table, but I'm, I'm, I'm gonna skip that. So now the question is, okay, these rational schemes, for example, in which you impose a uniform restrictions upon all cars are a bad idea. Mexico City is the best example. And uh, I'm not, we are not the, only, not the only paper showing that, there are other papers. But now the question is, can they ever work? And this is an important question. It's a very long, very long question because we see them more, 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 uh, around the uh, different, different places, so can deliver anything. And, uh, and the answer is when you allow for this vintage you know, differentiation, the answer is yes, they can deliver quite a lot, actually. And, uh, and this is, for example, one, the first paper looking at this was the paper looking at the low emission zones in, uh, in Germany, it was the paper by, by Wolf. And then we have a paper just, just forthcoming uh, with a uh, couple of uh, co-authors. 
uh, showing why these vintage restrictions can be a very good idea. And, um, and there are many things here that is important to notice. The first one is that now you have, there are two ways in which you can bypass the restriction. One is by buying a very old car, right, as before. The other one is by buying a cleaner car, which have no restriction. And what we observe in this program, in the program in Santiago in particular, is that that's the way people tend to bypass the restriction. They anticipate, for example, the purchase of a cleaner car so they can be exempt from the restriction. This is exactly what you want. You want to accelerate the fleet turnover towards you know, cleaner cars with the restriction. And uh, this is what we, what we, what we, what we, what we, what we observe in the, in the data. And uh, so I think the main message here is that these restrictions, when you use them, or these rationing schemes, you need to use them to uh, affect the extensive margin, not the intensive margin. Uh, you will, of course, affect the intensive margin because you're imposing you know, a, a restriction in the usage of the car. But mainly, you want them to really affect what cars you drive. And if you pay that attention to that mechanism, it's where you can get you know, a lot from, this, from, this, uh, from these policies. So the key to understand when this restriction can, can work reasonably well is whether correcting for the extensive margin, the type of car you drive, is very important. More important, for example, than correcting how much you drive. And for local pollution, this is, a, this is a, maybe not, not for global pollution, not for CO2, but for local pollution, that is very, very important. Why? Because most of the local pollution comes from old cars. 80% come from very old cars. And uh, I want you, I think the way to convince you about that is to show you this, um, this picture. We're not the, the first one to say this. Already, for example, there are papers by, by Kahn and Niller and, and Sandler and Jacobs and, and Sally showing exactly the same thing for local pollutants. It's the old cars, the ones that are contributing mostly with this uh, with pollution. By local pollution, I mean carbon monoxide, NOx, and hydrocarbons and particulates and all, and all that. And here you have, for example, data from, uh, uh, from Santiago, I mean, from, actually from, from the entire country, from Chile, you know, showing the clean cars, for example, that are in this, this vintage could be, uh, this is carbon monoxide, uh, could be, I don't know, uh, 10 times cleaner than cars that are, uh, I don't know, 15, 20 years older. And that's exactly the problem. So here, the extensive margin is very important because you want to move people towards these cars. And here, there are two things. Why? Immediately, I think you have the question, why these guys are much uh, cleaner than uh, these new cars than the old ones? There are two reasons. For fuel economy, you don't see much of a change. If you, drop this, I mean, if you draw the same picture for fuel economy using this date, you wouldn't see much of a change. You know, the fuel economy of a car remains pretty much constant throughout the entire life of a car. I learned, just learned that. I mean, there's little deterioration uh, during the lifetime of a car. But for local pollutants, it's completely different. I mean, not only because these cars enter with better technologies, but also because throughout the lifetime of a car, you know, things start getting worse and worse and worse. The converter, the catalytic converter doesn't work as well as the beginning, so you end up with more, more pollution. Uh, and the problem is that in this, in, in, in this you know, developing and emerging economies, the fleet tend to be very old. I mean, the average, you know, if you take a car randomly, for example, in Mexico City, the average, you know, life, I mean, the average age of that car is 14 years old. And uh, in Santiago, it's pretty much the same. In the US, it's nine years, or even less. So that's, you know, we have these very old cars, you know, running around the city and polluting, you know, a lot. So the objective with these policies is to move people faster than otherwise to these cleaner cars. And, uh, and here you have, for example, evidence from uh, this uh, vintage restriction, the first one, I think, as far as I know, that was implemented in, in, in Santiago, in which uh, the, the authority decided in 1993 to change the existing uh, restriction program by exempting all cars that were 93 and newer from the restriction. Why? Because those cars were, uh, were coming with uh, a, a converter, a catalytic converter. Cars before that didn't have it, so they were much cleaner. And the idea was to accelerate that process, you know, by extending ex ex exemption to all those cars. So what happened? If you look at what happened, for example, uh, 13 years after the policy, in 2006, 
Here you have uh, data on the fleet composition in Santiago, you know, the city with the restriction, and in the rest of the country. So what happens here? Here, the, the, you know, the, the dark bars are old cars, 92 and, 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 and older, and the light bars are 93 and, 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 and newer. So you see a big difference between the composition of the fleet between the two areas, the ones with the restrictions and the ones without the restriction. What's happening? Well, the policy is doing its work. It basically creates incentive for people here to buy this cleaner car faster than otherwise. And they're exporting you know, a large fraction of these cars to these other areas of the country in which pollution, local pollution at least, is not a problem. And uh, so this is the way the policy is, is, is operating. And for example, here, how much people are, you know, they value this, uh, this restriction. Here we have some data, for example, showing what is the price difference between a car with and without the restriction, using, for example, for different, different models. You know, small models like the Fiat Uno here, a small car, Toyota Corolla here. And we see, for example, a pre people are, willing, are ready to pay a premium of something between, I don't know, depending on the, on the specification, between 10% and 4%. People were ready to pay that to get rid of the restriction, pay this premium, and, and they did. And uh, so now, so we have this evidence, and now we want to start answering more interesting questions. What is the optimal design? If, you, if you're going to use these restrictions to really accelerate, you know, the, the fleet turnover, what is the optimal design? And for that, you need to understand how the market, the entire market, how the interaction between, you know, the new cars and the existing fleet interact and what happened, for example, over time. And, uh, and for that, you need to, uh, to develop uh, a dynamic model of the, the car market. Uh, that after a shock, you want to see how it evolves and what is the new, the new steady state. And so what, do, what we did, we developed this a vertical differentiation, dynamic model. Let me give you a little bit of a flavor of what it is. So there's a continuum of consumers with different willingness to pay for, for a new car which is cleaner and is a higher quality in our model. So we have only one dimension. And, uh, and then uh, here are the new cars. So this is, this is the consumers. You know, this is the, uh, the willingness to pay for, 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 for quality or for a new car. And um, so these guys here, they're high willingness to pay. They are the ones that are, you know, using these new cars. Then these guys are using, you know, cars with one year old, two year old and, and, and so on. And at some point, you uh, scrap the car, and then the rest of the people use public transport. So this is the uh, this is the flavor of, of the model. This, uh, and uh, and uh, one one shortcoming is that we have only one type of car in our model, no? like a representative car that ages over time and start you know to be traded from people with high willingness to pay for quality to people with lower willingness to pay for quality. I want to understand the dynamic of that and and, and how the fleet you know uh, evolves with that. And here you have a, let me show you some, some results of using, using, using that model. Uh, so here is a, the fleet composition in Santiago, in the place in which you have, your, or you eventually want to have a, the policy being implemented, and the rest of the country. And this applies to any place. You can, for example, do it in Paris. I mean, here you have Paris, for example, in which you're in a place of restriction, and then you want to look what happens in the rest of the area in which the secondary market for the, for the car market is operating. Right? You can have a restriction in this area, but this is going to affect prices you know, all over the place because the second-hand market is integrated. Uh, so here you have the composition of the fleet, for example, in, uh, as I said, in, in the, in the uh, potentially restricted area where you're going to impose the policy, and here in the rest of the country, and the vintages go from uh, up to 24 years old. And uh, so you see, for example, without any intervention, without any, nothing, uh, cars in Santiago, I mean, there's a larger proportion of uh, new cars than in the rest of the country, and the reason for that is because of income, higher income. Uh, you needed to control for that. Uh, so, uh, but these cars here are polluting, you know, quite a bit. And you're only imposing, you know, a restriction here, in this region. Uh, of course, it's going to have an impact over here, because some of these cars now, maybe they're going to be exported over here, where they have more value. Uh, for example, if you introduce Pigouvian taxation, we know that for cars, for local pollutants, I mean for CO2, we have a Pigouvian tax, right? We know that, uh, gasoline tax. Uh, but for local pollutants, there's no Pigouvian tax. We cannot monitor emissions very well. 
Uh, although, for example, the, uh, the congestion, I mean, the pollution charges in, is in London and in Milan that I mentioned before, what they do is they had, it's like a proxy. Look, this is the type of car you're driving. I assume you're emitting this much, and this is how much you're going to charge. So it's the expected Pigouvian damage, if you want. Uh, but if you could implement a Pigouvian tax, in principle, this is what the fleet would look like. So you get rid of all these very old polluting cars in Santiago, and all those guys are here in the rest of the country. And because of the secondary market operating, right? Uh, now, I mentioned before that introducing a uniform, now with this model, we can, we can think about different policy interventions. Anything you want. Scrappage subsidies for all cars, in which you're gonna affect, for example, you're gonna affect the time in which you uh, scrap the car. This capital T is the time in which you scrap the car. Uh, you can think about gasoline taxes. You can think of, for example, what we call circulation fees. Every time you register your car, whether it's a new car or it's an, it's an existing car, every year you need to register your car, get a permit to use your car, then maybe you can charge a tax for that. We also have that here in this model. You can, you can include any instrument that you, you, you can think of and start comparing all these different instruments and how much you get from instruments that you already see in practice with this, you know, perhaps better instrument or sometimes even worse. So the model allows you to do all that and more importantly allows you to understand what is the dynamic of the entire market, how the entire fleet, you know, evolves with this, with this instrument. This is exactly what we do in the, in the paper. So now, for example, uh, this is the big tax. What happens if you introduce a policy like the one in Mexico City? Uniform restrictions one day a week to all the fleet. And this is what I told you before. This policy is really bad because look what happened here. These are the new cars in the restricted area. You really reduce the value of a car, of a new car, because you're restricting that car 20% of the time. So now there's less incentives to buy those new cars. And that has an impact for the entire fleet. You're really making it you know, older. You keep these old cars running once and the first best, or the Peruvian, you want to get rid of those guys, but you cannot do it with these uniform restrictions. So that's why it's so bad. And here in these models, we're not even you know, considering the second car, that, that you're purchasing a second car, not even that. that. That is not here in this model because every household here has only one car. We simplify the model a little bit. Even without effect, this is, this is much more important. Now, what happens, for example, if you introduce a vintage-specific restriction, like the one in Paris, for example? that at certain age, you cannot use your car, period. That's it, nothing else. And this, think about what is a rationing scheme. It's a proportional rationing. Basically what you're saying is you're saying, look, I'm basically restricting on average the use of this car. So given that, given the, the, given the form of these policies, you either want a car to be used all the time or not to be used at all. That is gonna depend on the average value of that car. If the average value of that car, which is gonna be driven by one particular individual, is above the social value, you want that, or, or provide social benefit, social net benefits, you want that car to be driven always, no restriction whatsoever. If that is negative, you don't want the car to be driven whatsoever. So it's very simple. With this proportional rationing rules, this is what a driving restriction is, it's a proportional rationing rule, that's it. You either want the car to be driven 100% of the time or nothing. And because of that, you have this, the optimal restriction is a threshold. From here on, you want cars to be completely restricted. And from here on, no restrictions whatsoever. So in our model, for example, you want cars 16 years old to be completely restricted. And above that, there are not, there's no restrictions. That's the optimal policy. It's like the one in Paris, 79, 1997. You cannot just go into the city center. Uh, that, of course, is going to change in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, for some cars, maybe year 2000, for other cars, maybe year for diesel could be one year, for yeah, petrol could be another different year, of course, in a model, more complete model. But the logic is that either 100% restrictions or no restrictions at all uh, because of the form of the, uh, of the, this a proportional rationing rule. That's, that's the logic. It's not that you are restricting, you know, the less valuable trips. A driving restrictions is a proportional rationing rule. It's not uh, an efficient rationing rule, if you want, that you are you know, uh, destroying the less valuable trips. That's what a tax does, but not a driving restriction. That's an important difference. So here you have the optimal uh, driving restrictions. As I said, is you know, banning all those cars 16 years old and, and, uh, and, uh, and older. And uh, what you get, 
you're not in the first best, but you're close. You're, you got rid of all these guys, these very dirty, you know, polluting cars. And those guys, at the beginning, this is, a, this is very nice. This is a very nice mechanism that we didn't anticipate it. At the beginning, those cars were exported, exported to the rest of the country, of course. But eventually, those cars start dropping the price of these very old cars, and they were scrapped sooner than otherwise. So you end up also with a cleaner fleet in the rest of the country as well. At the beginning, no. But in the steady state, at the very end, it's because you're exporting all these old cars over here. And you're reducing the price of these guys here as well. And uh, so there's no leakage in the long run. There is no leakage. Uh, so here you have a table summarizing, for example, when you compare this, uh, this program to other interventions. Here is how bad a uniform restriction is, the one I mentioned before. Look, if you get 100%, this is the, this is the first best uh, gain. Uh, so uh, this is a 92% reduction of welfare. Really bad. Now, if you use uh, driving restrictions uh, with some exemptions, you get you know 16% of the first best gain. The optimal driving restriction give you 51% in our model. Not bad. Not bad. Now, whether you can implement that or not, perhaps you're going to be, be halfway between this and that. Now, here you have the scrappage subsidies, which are the, the scrappage subsidies have a problem. First, that sometimes, for example, you want to have these restrictions only during winter and fall. And a scrappage subsidy, you're also aiming at very old cars because you're moving these cars, but you remove them permanently. And maybe you don't want that. In this exercise, you know, I'm, I'm not including that, but in, in other parts of the, of, of the paper, we do that. So sometimes you only want to restrict, you know, circulation during, you know, maybe half of the year. A scrappage subsidy, either you remove the car completely or not at all. So this, that's why these policies work even, even better. And well, and these subsidies are expensive to implement. Now, circulation fees, this is the best policy that you can implement. Basically, every year you go and register your car where it's new or old, you have to pay what is expected, to, is the expected Peruvian payment, the expected Peruvian bill, if you want, and for all different cars. And with that, you get uh, much closer than the, uh, than, the, than the first best. You're not affecting you know, usage in the margin. But here, because you know, the most important uh, driver of, uh, of local pollution is the extensive margin, the car that you're driving. With this instrument, you can get very close to the, uh, to the first best. Gasoline taxes, really bad, 16%. Why? Because in the long run, by you know, imposing a tax on all cars, you, again, you are somehow delaying the entry of clean cars, new cars, because you're taxing everyone uh, with this gasoline. You're not separating or distinguishing between old cars and new cars. Everyone has to pay the same, the same tax. And uh, well, now if you combine, combine, for example, a gasoline tax with acts on the intensive margin with a driving restriction, then you can get a 61%. So here you have an example, the importance of the extensive or the intensive margin. And so um, this we had to do in the, 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 last, in the last revision of the paper. We, we did this exercise because our referee asked about this, and he was absolutely right about this. It was a very good, uh, very good comment about explain me how the restriction works in the, in the very short run, first year, for example, when the fleet is constant, compared to a gasoline tax, and then what happens in the very long run. And actually, he was absolutely you know, on the, uh, on the money. They work very differently because one act on the intensive margin, which is the gasoline tax, and the restrictions on the extensive margin. And for local pollution, as I, I hope I convinced you already, the extensive margin is important. But that is only takes some time. So in the short run, if you keep, for example, the fleet constant, this is exactly the same exercise done by Needle and Sandler in a recent paper, we get, with the gasoline tax, which is optimal at $2 per gallon, we get 50% of the first best, gain, first best gain in the short run keeping the fleet absolutely constant. They get 35% in, the, in their paper. It's a little bit different because I think our pollution damage, uh, our pollution damage figures are a little bit higher. Uh, and the restriction gives you less than 30%. So clearly in the short run, when only you are you know, trying to, to, uh, to adjust the intensive margin, the gasoline tax does better. But what happened in the long run? For example, the new state state, well, the gasoline tax does really bad, only 16%. Because you are affecting also these new cars that are coming to the market. You are delaying the entry of those guys. And the restrictions goes, does much, much, much better. 
51%. So I think this is the main message. Trying to understand, okay, what are you aiming at the intensive margin or the extensive margin? And for local pollution, again, what matters is the extensive margin. Uh, so congestion pricing, uh, is it feasible? I mean, we've seen it in some places. Uh, but clearly, uh, we don't see it in much where else. I mean, in nowhere in the emerging or developing world. There's nowhere. There's, there's some discussion, even in my home city, there's some discussion, but it's, I think it's going to take a long time for, to see any form of you know, congestion, congestion pricing in, 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 the, in, the near, in the near term. Uh, so um, now, what about the same instrument that we've been talking about so far, these rational schemes, using it for both? for congestion and for pollution, which, you know, it's what we, we, we observe. We have the two problems together. It's hard to separate the two. Uh, so now, you need to deal with two type of exemptions, right? Uh, if you think about congestion, you want to impose restrictions upon all cars. But if you do that, people are going to start buying a second car. So what would be a vintage so for pollution, we have the vintage exception. If you have an ex exemption, you have a new car, clean car, you face no restrictions. What would be the equivalent for congestion? There is nothing because all cars, electric vehicles, whatever, they should be you know, uh, equally, equally restricted because they all congest the same. There's one thing that you can do. Well, if you want to get exempted, you have to pay. You have to pay a congestion toll. This is the, this is, so this is what we're proposing. So uh, the way you combine these two problems with a restriction is that you allow for these exemptions of two types. A toll exemption, dealing with the congestion, and a vintage exception, dealing with the pollution. Uh, because, for example, in, by, in, like in many places, pollution is only a problem during some months of the year. The, the, the vintage exemptions only act during that time of the year in which you have pollution, say winter and fall. The other one, the toll exemption, acts every time. If you don't do that, then you go back to the uniform restrictions, which are really, really a bad idea. And it's better not to have any policy at all. So these driving restrictions, I mean, these driving restrictions for congestions can only work if you allow for these toll exemptions. And I think to me, you can think about it. What happens, for example, if you restrict a car every day, every single day of the week, but you allow, you know, the driver of that car to pay at all? Then you're in London or you're in, 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 in New York. Perhaps it's very hard to start with that, but you may start with one day restriction. And if in that day you want to use your car, well, you pay the toll. And so with that, you kill any incentive to buy a second car because it's much cheaper to just pay the toll that day. So this is what we're proposing. I'm talking to you know, policy makers in my, in, my, in, my, in my city about this. And they're more inclined to think about something like this that is less radical than a full you know, congestion pricing for every single day. And uh, so you can start with this and eventually moving up. And uh, so, um, so here I have some, uh, some numbers. Uh, we uh, developed this, uh, this, this model based on a, on a previous paper by, by Basso. And, uh, and here we really pay attention to different income groups. Because when you start thinking about this congestion pricing scheme, distributional issues are crucial. If you don't pay attention to them, then you can really screw up the, uh, the, uh, the whole thing. And so we uh, divide the population in five income groups, and then uh, we uh, also we pay close attention to the different cars that these people own, because some of them are going to be restricted, for example, during, some, during winter and fall. Uh, and it's very heterogeneous, the car, type of car. For example, the, the high income groups, they tend to own very clean, car, very clean cars and then newer cars. And groups one and two and three, they tend to own these older, older cars. So uh, you pay attention to all that. I need to bring one equation. <laughs> this is the only one <laughs> that I have. And um, so uh, this is a little bit of our calibration of the model. I show you that all, I mean, you know, uh, low income people, group one, are very price elastic. If you introduce it all, these people are going to leave the car at home right away. But the very high income people, actually, if you introduce it all, they're going to use their cars more. Why? Because now they can go faster. So this is what our model is capturing. So I think it's uh, so here you have some results depending on this is the aggregate overall welfare, depending on the pass, it, the congestion toll that you use. Uh, that you use this is the optimal. If you have, for example, five-day restrictions, this would be like London or New York. 
You know, every time you use a car, you have to pay the toll. And this would be with one day restriction. Of course, you know, you get a, less, a lot less surplus with one day, rest you're restricting basically people only once a day. Uh, a week, so it's not much. So we're proposing to have a two days restriction, something like this to start with. Otherwise, you know, you're not really alleviating congestion much. Uh, so but if you can go all the way up here, yeah, you have a big amount, like 0.5 of GDP. This is our estimate that, that, you're, that you get, you're getting. Now, this is the important thing that I want to show here. Distributional implication. The poor, they r do really bad. Regardless of whether you have one day restrictions or five day restrictions, they really do, they really suffer from this policy. Uh, so, uh, and the rich, you know, the, the, the high income group, they benefit, the more restrictions, the more they benefit because the faster they can go. They really like the policy, they love it. So you really need to do something about this. Otherwise, you know, this will be very regressive. And the way to do it is to take all, you know, the uh, toll revenues and put it back into the public transportation system. And there are two ways you can do it. One is producing you know, the, uh, the, uh, the ticket, the fare. The other one is just a combination of the two, reducing you know, the fare and improving quality, improving frequency. Here I'm going to show you just, for example, what do you do if you reduce, for example, if you use all the money to reduce the, uh, the fare. And, and if you do that, now low income people are very happy. So you solve you know, this distributional problem. And, uh, and the rich people are still very happy because then they can drive much faster. So distributional implications are crucial when you start thinking about this, these schemes. And finally, uh, smog checks. This is also I'm doing some research, research on this, and uh, some may think that this is a way to, uh, in order to, to, to prevent these very old cars and highly polluting cars to, to go around. And it's not true. It's not true because you know, uh, we have some evidence. This is a very nice paper from uh, Paulina Oliva from, uh, I think, still in Santa Barbara, uh, looking at uh, smog checks in Mexico City. And she found, you know, strong evidence of corruption. Basically, you pay someone to just uh, uh, use a different car than yours in the station. You know, uh, when you go through the uh, station line, they just replace your car with a different one. And the way that she did it is very nice because she found a very strange correlation of data. Sometimes you have, you know, like three uh, data points with exact the same emissions. So this is something suspicious. And what is, is, what's evidence of, uh, of, of, uh, of, uh, of a fraud? Uh, so we are trying to answer a different question in this uh, paper, uh, which is sometimes we've had too much, much competition between these uh, certificate providers, these uh, smoke check stations. That may be bad. They may have incentives, you know, to relax the standards, and that's what we're finding. And uh, and uh, so to study this problem, and uh, so this is a case in which too much competition could be bad. Basically, this is what we're doing in this paper, trying to show that, and could be bad because you uh, provide less quality, but not to the consumers. Consumers don't care. They they want the certificate. They provide less quality to all of us. You know, more than we end up with more pollution. So it's not the typical, you know, IO question whether if you allow to competition, then companies are going to start providing lower quality products. You as a consumer, you're going to suffer th th that. Here is different. Me, I, I don't care. This is, I just want, to, I need a certificate just to go around. Uh, but the problem is that we're going to end up with more, with more pollution. And some of our numbers, you know, show that you end up with, I don't know, uh, with 10% more, but I don't want to show you any, any numbers yet because we're still, you know, uh, working on this. And, uh, and what we do to, uh, to really check for this uh, competition hypothesis, whether more competition is bad for, for, for the environment, is uh, we look at the, we exploit this uh, uh, entry. These are the, all the smog check stations in, uh, in Santiago. And uh, so what we do is we exploit, for example, here you have this station plan, this alone in 2014, and one year later has competition from that guy at a much lower prices, 50%. And what is interesting is that when this guy, instead of reacting by lowering their prices, they react by relaxing the standards. They keep the prices high because maybe there are some non-shoppers that people that are new cars, they don't care, they know they're gonna pass, you know, anyway. So the competition is not by lowering the price, which they can do, but it's by relaxing the, the standard. So now they tend to you know, pass more cars than otherwise. And, um, and here you have another example of an entry. For example, there was this, this station here. And now 
there's a new operator because it was auctioned off, you know, the site was auctioned off, there was competition for that site, and the guy that win the, the site, you know, uh, offer a much lower, lower price for the service, 50% less. So again, you have all these guys suffering from that. And we see that these guys are reacting to that, not by lowering the prices, but by relaxing the standards. Uh, so, conclusions. First, the political economy of what you can do and what you cannot do is essential. And that may change from country to country. In some places, perhaps in Nordic countries, you may I've seen some papers that maybe you are able to use gasoline taxes or other type of taxes. I, good, fine. I mean, we are economists, we, we like that. I think this is... Uh, but in many other places you cannot. And uh, so uh, what I, I wanted to show you here is that these uh, rational schemes are becoming increasingly popular in many places. So the question is how you design them properly in order to get some benefit. Maybe not close to the first best, but some benefit, some positive benefit uh, out of them. And um, subsidies are very expensive. I mean, for electric vehicles, whether for new cars or to remove old cars, scrappage subsidies are very expensive. So we hardly see them. I mean, uh, in some places, yes, in Norway, you know, we've been talking about that. Subsidies to electric vehicles are huge, but they want to change that. And I, in the rest of the world, we don't see them. And I, you know, I always tell, you know, the policymakers in my home country, never use that if you can use these other policies to discourage people to own these old polluting cars. It's better not to use those subsidies for that because you, first you have this huge adverse selection problem. You're going to be paying subsidies for things that are going to be done anyway. So um, it's always better to work with taxes than with subsidies, I think. Uh, now, what is key for this, well, for congestion, of course, but also for local pollution, is to target the existing fleet, not just the new cars. I mean, just by changing, for example, fuel efficiency standard or you know, emission standards, it may take too long. Now we have a, you know, a large number of very old cars on the road and you need to care, take care of all those guys. And they are gonna be there for a long, long time. Given you know, the motorization rates that I showed you before, these are guys are gonna stay there for a long time. So you really need to target these old cars. You need policies for that, not to wait for the, for, you know, for the, for the new cars to, to remove them. And, um, uh, and, and, and important, you know, related to that, it's important to inter understand the interaction between you know, policies uh, aim at new cars and the existing fleet. How the two interact? This is one, just one single market. The new cars and you know, the existing fleet is just one single market. You cannot separate the two. You cannot just do an analysis for, for the new market because most of the action, especially when it comes to local pollution, is in the existing fleet. And whether, for example, you extend the life of these old cars or whether those guys move from one place to another, whether there's more local pollution or not. So this is what is important to understand. And I give you two very important examples on that. Gasoline taxes, they may work very nice in the short run when you assume that the fleet is constant, but they work really bad, even for local pollution, when you assume that the fleet is gonna, you know, uh, is gonna evolve. And um, distributional considerations, of course, are crucial, not only in this type of policies, in any policy. And I show you one example about you know, congestion pricing of these uh, congestion tolls combined with these driving restrictions. And uh, the way to solve this, I think it's very simple. Keep all the money and give it back to people in the public transport. New York is actually doing that. London is doing that. Stockholm is doing that. But in many places, it's not so easy to earmark the money because there's some constitutional, for example, restrictions. This is my case, in my, for example, in my country. You cannot just take the money and give it back to the public transport. You need to have special law. It's, it's very hard to circumvent that, that restriction. But if you don't do that, if you don't get this uh, recycling in this way, there is nothing you can do. I mean, it's very, very hard to pass this kind of uh, legislation. Uh, and, and of course, there's a lot more research uh, needed here. There's a lot of policies you know, around. Uh, we need to understand how they work and, how, and sometimes how they don't work. And, and also, I encourage you to get more involved in the policy making process. Talking to policy makers about your findings and all that, I think it's important. And sometimes they listen. How much they listen? Uh, my experience is that they do, some. Uh, not enough, but, but at least you get, you get some. And um, so with that, um, I'm done. Thank you.